um, write it in the chat box and I'll assist you there. Um, if you want to ask a question, feel free to unmute yourself. Um, you can type it in the chat. I can ask it for you, whatever you'd like. We'll do some readings and in between, um, we encourage uh, discussion and questions. Um, I'll just start with a, an introduction. Nancy is widely published. Um, she is a professor at University of Delaware. She has taught theater, drama, playwriting, creative writing, and multidisciplinary studies with an emphasis on world literature. She has published seven previous works of nonfiction and five novels. Her new memoir, Breaking the Silence, explores the power of stories in healing from trauma and abuse. Her career has emphasized the use of her own experience in being silenced to encourage students to find their voices and to express their thoughts, feelings, and experiences with authenticity as a way to add meaning to their lives. Please welcome Nancy King and her memoir, Breaking the Silence. Thank you very much for being here. And I'd like to do, introduce Jill Haig, who is in London, and it's midnight for her. She wrote the preface to my uh, memoir, and she was very instrumental in getting it published because I wasn't sure it was worth publishing. And she's done a lot of work with, uh, with dealing with abuse, domestic violence. And she's also written a new book about domestic violence, the history of it, and we've come further than you think. So I'd like to give Jill just a minute or two to welcome her and thank her for her participations so she doesn't fall asleep on us. <laughs> Jill? That's her book, yes. Sorry, Jill, you'll have to unmute yourself again. Thank you, Nancy. Um, I'm just saying this is um, my new book, which is just out, History and Memories of the Domestic Violence Movement. We've come further than you think. Um, so I just want, I'm just talking to you from the, the UK where it's past midnight and um, with my funny UK accent. Um, and it's lovely to see wonderful Santa Fe. Oh, I wish I could be there. Um, I just wanted to say I was honored beyond words, um, really, to be able to write the foreword um, for Nancy's unique and um, moving memoir. Um, with the stories, I think we're going to hear some of them, the stories about Nancy's recovery from extreme physical and sexual childhood abuse, which was a long journey, a journey of 80, 80 years, yeah? Yeah. Um, and um, I wanted just to say the memoir highlights, I think, resistance, uh, resilience, and um, finally recovery. Um, and the thrilling thing about the memoir, I think, is it's not linear, but it unfolds through these beautiful vignettes which talk about the abuse, but are also then redemptive. So it's a redemptive journey of recovery that can inspire us and can inspire other survivors and victims of abuse. So I just wanted to say at the beginning, thank you, Nancy, for your wonderful work. Just thank you so much. Well, and my thanks to you for encouraging me to keep going. I never meant to write a memoir. I thought I would write my sixth novel and my psyche said, uh-uh, time to write nonfiction. And um, I wrote it first because it just, that was just what came out of my fingers on the computer. But I realized that I was writing material that I could never talk about and still can't talk about. And it's interesting that when somebody asked me to read one of the very early chapters, which are quite short, I started to, and then it was like I was back in that pantry with my uncle, with all the horror, and it was like I couldn't, I couldn't, couldn't stabilize myself. 
I, I, I wasn't in my body. I wasn't in Santa Fe. I wasn't in 20, it was 19, 2020. And it, it, it told me how much power that early abuse has. And there are a lot of books about how to recover from abuse, how to heal from abuse. But I think you learn to change coping mechanisms so that the coping mechanism that you had as a child, for example, I tried to make myself as invisible as possible. It doesn't work too well when you're teaching at a university. And so I had to learn new coping mechanisms. And I also had to learn to respect the fact that all that happened was still in my body. And even though I've done a lot of body work and years and years of therapy, it's still in my body. And so I can tell you that I am healing, but I think it's a lifelong process and it's not easy and it's full of surprises, not very welcome. For example, last year, I finally broke down and got a smartphone, which gazillion million people all over the world have done. And it triggered three weeks of trauma. You're stupid. You can't do this. You don't know how to do this. Why are you doing all old voices, all, all not very helpful. And the truth is that my father was, um, my father enabled my mother. He was sexually obsessed with me. And I think that spurred my mother's jealousy. But he also was um, a very advanced first aid person. During the war, he was um, a block captain in case bombs fell. That was World War II. Um, and so when my mother broke bones, he would often set them when he, she broke, when she dislocated joints, um, she, he would set them and not very well sometimes. When I was four and seven, she broke my nose. And when I was seven, my father took me to an ear, nose and throat doctor. And when the doctor told him how much it was going to cost, my father said, well, she can breathe through her mouth. And so for 60 years, literally, I couldn't breathe through my nose. And it was only, shall I say, fortuitous. Um, I was playing tennis and it was a, a session and the woman in front of me moved back when she shouldn't have and smashed the racket in front of my face. And so I had reconstructive surgery. So at the ripe old age of 67, I was suddenly able to breathe through my nose, except that it was like my nose and mouth went to war. And my, my mouth said, okay, nose, it's your turn. And my nose said, I don't know how to do this mouth. You keep going. And the result was I was sit breathing, which made me feel like I was asphyxiating. And I had to literally learn how to breathe through my nose. And people who um, have worked on me said, you know, Nancy, it would be helpful if you really did take a deep breath. But all those years, it's hard to eradicate. And so my mother never pretended to love me, but my father would say he loved me and he was very often very affectionate. But what kind of love is it when you don't protect your daughter from the murderous violence of his wife, my mother? And he came upon, the one time he came upon her actually choking me, the next day I was sent when I was four to my aunt and uncle. And I lived with them almost a year. And I was prey to my uncle Walter's pedophilia. And there was no escape and there was no way out. And so I learned to endure. And as one dentist told me, your pain threshold is much too high for your own good. And that pain threshold developed when I was constantly being hurt. And I learned not to say much, not to cry, because if I cried, my mother would just keep going. And my uncle would, well, he would make things harder. So showing my feelings physically, was impossible. And telling, talking about my feelings was not welcome. In fact, it was denied. And so what made the abuse so much more difficult to deal with is that my parents lied about it. My father was a few days away from dying. And I asked him, Dad, there are things about my early life I'd like to know. And his response was, it would only hurt your mother. I don't want to talk about it. 
well, he didn't say nothing happened. I guess I should be lucky. So it was very, it permeated every fiber of my being. And I learned from my mother and from others that um, there was gonna be no help. It turns out that everybody in my father's family and my mother's family knew that there was a great deal of abuse going on. And I would like to ask a favor of everybody. When someone says they were abused as a child, particularly if it was a long time ago, a most unhelpful answer is, well, that was then, people didn't talk about it then. And that's somehow supposed to make me feel better. I mean, why weren't people then, why didn't they have the courage to say something or do something? It's not an excuse. It would be much better if they said, what was it like for you? Or how did you feel? But, but dismissing it, well, people didn't talk about it in those days is not helpful. And in fact, it's very hurtful. It's like when I was diagnosed with leukemia and they said, you, you take such good care of yourself as if somehow I'm superhuman and not subject to the travails that make us human. So um, the other thing was because my father didn't really want to deal with it. If I would say something, he would say, you're strong, you can manage. And he also let me know you're responsible for everything you say and everything you do, it's on you. And people would say to me, why do you have to upset your mother? Why do you have to cause trouble? It's so, pe my sister would say more often than not, it's so peaceful when you're not around. And so as a little kid, I thought, well, okay, since everybody is blaming me, I must be doing something wrong. And if I could just figure out what I'm doing wrong, then I wouldn't get hurt, except that I couldn't figure out what I was doing wrong. The one time I did do something wrong, I was maybe 10 and I was doing my homework in the living room, which was a no-no. And I spilled ink on the, so the sofa cushion and I turned it over. And when my mother found the ink many, many, many days later, she said, Nancy, I said, I don't know anything about that. I never do my homework in the living room. And my sister said, yes, you did. Yes, you did. And I said, and I would never cop to the fact that I actually spilled the ink and I never ever did. So, because if you're gonna get hit or hurt for no reason that you can figure out, you certainly don't wanna give anybody a reason to do that. And I did my best not to give them. But all my life I was told I'm stupid, I'm clumsy, I ask too many questions, I'm too sensitive, too quiet, too serious. And so I, I grew up quite isolated. And what comforted me was I learned, and I don't know how I learned this, but I learned to create a theater in my mind and I would tell myself stories. And of course I was always the heroine and I was always saving children. I didn't worry too much about adults. And even when I was, well, I don't know whether my aunt and uncle got the newspaper, but when I was five, I was allowed to come home and I could read the newspaper in World War II. And I would say, who's saving the children? Who's saving the children? And my mother would slap me and say, go out and play. And so I, one of the outcomes or the results of the abuse was that I had an acute awareness of other people's suffering and especially children. And I'd like to tell you, when I was 19, I got a job as a recreational therapist um, in a mental hospital. I didn't worry too much about the recreational stuff. And since I knew nothing about therapy, I was sure I'd get training, which I didn't. And I was in charge of a building of 300 women. And I was learning to manage pretty well. And then, I sometimes got into trouble and there was a, a, a boy, guy, young man, and um, he worked as a, as a therapist too, summer therapist. And when he heard that someone was threatening to fire me, he went to his father, who was the chief pathologist and said, if you fire Nancy, I'm going to the newspapers and I'm gonna tell them what I know. I have no idea what he knew, but it must have been pretty awful because I never got fired. But one day, I was, went to pick up my patients and I was told to go to the office of the chief psychiatrist. And it's, it's a wonder I made my feet walk to that building and I thought, are they gonna put me in the hospital as a patient? 
And I mean, I was just terrified. I had no idea what was going on. So I found the chief psychiatrist's office. And by this time I was shaking with worry and fear and clutching my keys, ready to say, you can't put me in there. I have my keys, I'm not a patient. Anyway, he said to me, um, Miss Rubin, I hear you're a very good storyteller. And I said, uh, I, well, you could tell I was very articulate. And he said, well, we have some children here. We're planning a unit of 400 children. And right now we have some children and the attendants are having difficulty working with them. And we thought perhaps you could tell them stories. I said, well, he said, and you've been released from working in the af two afternoons a week from the women's building and you'll come and work with the children. And I said, well, I, I don't have any keys. And he said, oh no, you won't need keys. The attendant will let you in and then she will lock the door behind you. Well, I said, okay, I mean, what choice did I have? And he said, um, they're waiting for you. So I had no time to prepare, no time to think, and I couldn't stop shaking. And the attendant said, good luck, slammed the door and locked it. And there were, I don't know, seven or eight children between the ages of eight and 11, screaming, yelling, crying, biting, hitting. It was, it was just horrible. And I didn't know what to do. So I sat down on the floor and I just waited. I mean, I thought, well, if they come and they hurt me, I don't know what I'll do. But after what seemed like 10 years, but it was probably only a few minutes, they began to quiet down. And then one of them looked like the oldest said, what are you doing here? And I said, um, well, I like to tell stories. And I didn't want to say the psychiatrist sent me. I didn't want to, I just, I mean, I just didn't know what to say or what to do. And so what kind of stories? And I said, well, um, once upon a time stories. Well, we don't like once upon a time stories. And I said, well, okay, what kind of stories do you like? And then they started, we like stories about this and this and, and everybody had an idea about what kind of story they wanted. And I said, well, okay, why don't we just make a, a story together? Um, somebody can start and, and when they're finished, you can point to the next person and they can keep going and, and we'll just make a, a story for all of us. Desperation does wonderful things. And so they quieted down and I said, let's make a circle. And they made a circle. And then one of the younger kids just snuggled in my lap like a little puppy and another one came and they got really close and we started the story and, and it was <laughs> once upon a time. And then at the end they said, and you finish it. I said, no, I'm not gonna finish it. This is a group story, why should I finish it? And they said, of course you're in charge. I said, well, actually I'm just here to tell stories that doesn't make me in charge. And we, we got to talking, uh, the children told me how terrible things were, that they couldn't go outside, just they could only go in the little courtyard because once they had gone out and, and they had put leashes on them and that they just really wanted to run around and, and okay, they were mentally ill, I guess, but they were also children and they were suffering and it was just horrible. And then I heard a click, the door opened Miss Rubin, you can leave, not even giving me time to say anything to the children. And I said, okay, I'll see you in a few days. And she yanked me and closed the door. So that started my time with these children. And it was a very powerful lesson because I did a lot of things that I wasn't allowed to do. They begged me to let me out, let them go outside. They just wanted to run around. Now, okay, they were mentally ill, but they were also children. And um, I found a way without any, the thing about the mental hospital is if you didn't cause a trouble, if you didn't cause problems, nobody really cared what you did unless it was really illegal. Um, and I'm not even sure about that. And so I got to 
I told the psychiatrist that I needed to have a set time with the children. It wasn't good for them or me to just have the door open and be yanked out without any kind of warning. So they said, well, how about an hour? Because everybody, all of the attendants, aides, they hated working with the children and the children felt it. So we started telling stories and we devised a scheme for them to go outside, which required them to cooperate. And so I said, okay, I can let you out the, um, to the little yard, but when I raise my hand, you have to pay attention and you have to come to me right away. And we're gonna practice that. And we practiced that. And then one of them said, we need to go outside. I just need to run. And I of course understood that really well. And so I managed to open the, the patio door with one of the keys I had. I didn't know I could do that. And without telling him anyone, I let the kids out and I had warned them ahead of time. If you don't come back, then you'll never see me again. It's up to you. And I say, even though they were mentally ill children and God knows what problems they had, they understood loyalty and they understood that I was trying to help them. And so I opened the door and they ran and they ran and they ran and they ran and they ran. And then I raised my hand and very quickly, it just came back. And they said, we aren't finished running. And I said, I know, but that was a practice. Go and run some more. And they ran and they ran and they ran. And then I raised my hand again. I said, we have to go inside right now. And they ran in, I locked the door, got in the room, sat in a circle and the attendant opened the door and said, goodbye. And so that was one experience where um, what I, I think what they understood was that I didn't know beans about mental health. I didn't know anything about mentally ill children, but I knew about children who were suffering and they rose to the occasion. And there was one occasion when a photographer wanted to take pictures and I went to the kids and I said to the photographer, don't come in, it's an upset day. The kids aren't good, please don't come in. And he said, I have four kids of my own. I know how to do and he walked into the room and the kids attacked him broke his camera and he screamed and of course you know who suffered and I kept I was crying and I said I told you it wasn't a good day he's good day bad day they're not they're just animals and the kids were crying and it was just it was just awful and I said to the attendant please give me a few minutes she said they're going to attack you and I said okay they'll attack me could I just have a few minutes and I closed the door and they just they just piled on top of me, just crying, weeping. And, and, and they couldn't understand why they had done what they did, but it was just, it was just a reminder that, um, at least in my opinion, no matter how mentally ill some people are, there's a healthy part of them and there's a part that responds to caring and loving, and they certainly did. And so that was a, a very powerful, experience um, when I was, well, at the end of June, I turned 20, so I was no longer a teenager. I felt like, well, that was an improvement. So I'd like to pause here for a minute if anybody has any questions. I have a couple um, I can ask that were emailed to us, Nancy. Um, what was the first thing that you did um, in your life that helped you cope with the devastating after effects of child abuse? Well, I think one of the things that helped me that I just told you about was helping children. Um, I, I, it, helping those children made me feel like I wasn't so stupid. I, maybe I wasn't so clumsy. Maybe I, I, I was not such a bad person. Um, I think that one of the one of the concomitant factors of abuse is because you're a child, you you think it's all your fault, and so all of the nasty, miserable things my mother said about me, I believed them, and so when I had a chance to work with the children, 
and I, I could see that I was helping them, but they were also helping me. And it began to open a little crevice and maybe my mother wasn't 100% right. Maybe she was only 99% right. So helping um, the children was a, was, a big, uh, was a big factor. And it's also why I became a teacher. I wanted to make a safe space for children. And I wanted to be able to have children feel like could, they could make mistakes and not be punished and that they could try things out and, and not have things go right and still be okay because I felt like I was not okay. And if I didn't, and even when I would get 92, for example, on, a, on an exam, my parents would, they said they were kidding, but they would say, you know, where are the other eight points? And, or when I was, um, I took a test, I didn't know what it was for. And it turned out it was for an advanced program in junior high school, you did three years and two. And I was there when my mother opened the letter and inviting me into the program. And my mother said to me, they must have made a mistake. You're not that smart. And so um, it's, it's very hard to excavate those negatives about yourself you, because nobody intervened, nobody interfered. Um, after my mother and father, my father died in 79 and my mother died in 85. And after they died, some of my father's relatives talked a little bit about my mother and father. Well, my father walked on water for them, so it was only my mother, but my mother's family also talked a little bit. And they, when my, one of my mother's sisters was 97, she told me that they all knew that my mother had been in a mental hospital. They all knew that my mother had mental issues, that nobody ever said anything to me, nobody helped me. And nobody, and she said, you know, we made fun of you because you were so serious. You would sit in a corner facing the wall and you would read and we'd make fun of you. And so she was 97 when she said that. And I was 70. It was a little too little, too late. But um, I grew up in a very unsafe world. There was a lot of anti Semitism, and my parents were communists for a while, up until 47, when the Soviet Union and the Communist Party of the United States sort of merged. And my parents were only interested in making the world better for people, social security, free lunch for children. And in this country, once you're a communist, you're always a communist, even if you're not a communist anymore. And because of the anti-communism, I was always afraid if I said something, my parents would be taken away. And then where would I go? My experience away from home was so terrible. It's, it's like, well, at least I know how to deal more or less, more or less, mostly less with my parents. But um, it, it made me very aware. One of the things that children hated about me was that if they said, let's ring the doorbell and run away, and I said, well, what if somebody slips and falls on the way to opening the door? Children do not like that at all. And so I was not um, particularly wanted, except I lived on a block. I don't know how this happened, but all the Jewish kids in my elementary school lived on my block, all seven or eight of us. And after school, we all played and they didn't have to like you. They needed people to play. So we played, but... Um, I was never invited to anyone's house. And of course, I didn't dare invite anybody to my house because I didn't know how my mother would be. But that was actually wrong because my mother was a great hostess. She was a flirt. She was a real good cook and a good baker, and she'd set a fine table. And if you had come to my house, you would have seen what wonderful food, wonderful hostess, children well you know, dressed nicely, obviously well fed perfect household and nothing showed. And there was never any hint of the horrors that um, I was experiencing. And that didn't really stop un until I got much, much bigger. And then it was mostly psychological. And um, like when my first book was published 50 years ago, Movement for Actors, 
my mother said, well, it's a very small book, which it was, but it was a book. And um, I can think of some other things she might have said. So it was a very, so what I am trying to say is that the abuse has, after effects, has plays out in different ways, psychologically, emotionally, physically. And the thing is, at least I wasn't aware of the forces acting on me. So I made a lot of bad decisions emotionally, but my parents were also, um, shall I say, helping the abuser. Um, I became pregnant from a man who wouldn't use um, a condom. And when I had tried to get a diaphragm, they told me I had to come back. I had a ring, a phony ring, but they told me I had to come back with my wedding license, my marriage license. And that, and so I got pregnant. I had a terrible legal abortion. And, but I, when I told the, the, the guy that I was pregnant, it was like one o'clock in the morning and I was in front of his apartment and he looked at me and he said, he stroked my hair and he said, you have such beautiful hair. And he stroked it and then he left, he walked away. And so I had no money and I had no way of knowing anything. And my father was a pharmacist and I knew he had helped people. And it was a really horrible, horrible experience. Five different practitioners before I found one that would do it. And they did it without anesthesia. And um, so I of course didn't wanna see this man again. And about two weeks afterwards, um, he called, my mother answered the phone and she told me he was on the phone and I said, I don't wanna to talk to him. And she said, well, you're damaged goods. You might as well talk to him. Nobody else will want you. And he was in Wisconsin. And what he said was he wanted me to come to Wisconsin to be with him. And I said, no. And the next thing I knew, my parents had bought an airplane ticket for me to go to Wisconsin. And they drove me to the airport and they put me on the plane and I went to Wisconsin and the abuse just continued. And so there was no safe place, no, no help from within and no help from without. And I had, I had no idea how unsafe I felt in my core until I spent a month in fascist Spain. And maybe I'll stop here if there are questions. Elaine asks, um, can you talk about the old voices that arise and how you throughout your life have learned to deal with them? Well, the shorter answer, short answer is not very well, um, but um, I didn't realize how deeply embedded in me these voices were until I did the vision quest at 80 and I was by myself in the woods for four days and four nights. And um, it's very, I'm not a woo woo sort of person, but it was like there was a guide and the guide was um, liberating all of these voices. And, and in a sense, letting me know that the voices were not true. And it was like a kind of earthquake and it's a good thing I was by myself and it's a good thing I was in the woods because I've always been comforted in the woods. And these voices just came out. And at least I became aware of how old these voices were. And I'd like to tell you, I immediately banished them. Unfortunately, I'm a very slow learner. And there was a time when I was teaching in the university honors program, which is the most academic unit on campus. And I thought to myself, gosh, if I'm so stupid, if I'm not smart, how come I'm teaching in the most academic unit on campus and nobody is telling me I shouldn't be teaching here? Maybe I'm not so stupid after all. Now, that's pretty late, but now I have come to realize that there's a kind of reflex. When I mess up, the voices start. And I have to tell myself, that was then, this is now, those are old voices. 
And it's actually a lot of work. There's nothing um, automatic. I don't say, oh, there's that voice again. Although I am starting to do that. I was looking in the mirror and I was thinking, hmm, the next time I hear that voice, I'm saying, oh, go away. We don't need you anymore. You're... And so that's my new plan. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. You've written um, five novels, correct? Yep. Um, and you thought you were writing your sixth, but then it turned into uh, these stories about abuse. What do you think sparked this finally in your life, um, that finally it was the time that you had to break the silence? What was it that at this point in your life that you needed to finally address all of these pains in your life and well i when i was teaching in the university i helped student write memoir and i taught at um local junior high and i was teaching memoir and the children there had all failed their language arts and they didn't feel i had any stories to write and so i I was aware of the fact that I had a story to tell and that I hadn't told it. And so I began, I just began writing stories as they came to me. And um, when I had about 300 pages, I realized that this is what I needed to be writing. And I started writing. And some of the episodes revealed to me outwardly what it was like inwardly. For example, when I went to Spain in 1959, I knew Franco was in charge and I knew Spain was a fascist state. He'd been there for the leader for 20 years, but it didn't really sink in until I got to the airport and the, the Guardia Seville were opening people's suitcases, throwing things out, taking what they wanted. And there was no recourse. Although one funny thing happened, the woman in front of me, they opened a suitcase, threw everything out and they opened her diaphragm case and they said to her, what's this? And she said, oh, I put powder in it and then I powder my face. And they said, oh, and they put it back in. And, and so um, I, there, when, when I got to Spain, I had to go to the police station and I had to show them my passport and I had to uh, they helped me find a pension and they told me I had to be back at 11 o'clock or the, the, the woman or the man would um, call the police and I would be arrested. And the policeman said, and you don't want to be arrested. And I thought, oh, I'm just me. I just want here to learn Spanish. I'm never going to get in trouble. I'm not that kind of person. And I got a pension near the university and I thought, okay. I'll go and I'll have a din meal at the din university dining area, a restaurant, because it's cheap. And I got there and it was really crowded and I had my food and I didn't know where to sit. And then this guy stood up in Spanish and said, hey, come on, join us. There's a room here. And so I was starting to practice my baby Spanish, which was really hilarious to them. And then all of a sudden, and I do mean all of a sudden, they grabbed me and pulled me and started running. And there was no getting out from under them. They pulled me, they dragged me, we ran and ran. At one point, the guy just picked me up and carried me. We went to a cave and I thought, how is this possible that I am in a cave? I have no idea where I am with four strange men. And my whatever Spanish I knew disappeared and they didn't speak much English. And they didn't, and they started drinking wine and laughing. And um, then they decided I should drink from this pouch. And of course, I got it all over my shirt. So now it looked like I had bloody shirt. And um, then they went to sleep. And so I laid down. And the next thing I knew, they were gone. And I was alone in this cave, no idea where I was. And then a woman came and she spoke very good English. And she said that she was, she apologized, but the four young men had been wanted by the Guardia Civil. And if I had stayed, they would have 
assumed I was part of the revolution because no young woman would be seen with four young men if she wasn't, if she didn't know them and wasn't part of them. And I said, but I've missed curfew. The police are going to be looking for me. What, what am I going to do? And she said, don't worry. I have a story. And I'm going to say that you got very sick and I found you in the gutter and um, I took care of you. And um, I will tell the the woman and the pension that um, you are still not feeling well. So could you please pretend to be ill? I didn't need to pretend. And she brought me back and the, the woman started screaming at me in Spanish and, and I kept saying, mm, and I went, oh. And the, the young woman whose name I did not know um, said, must have said something because she finally said, okay. And I went upstairs and, um, then I was taking a bath and she knocked on the door and she said, hurry up, police. And um, I got dressed and I went downstairs and I didn't have to pretend. Um, I didn't understand a word they were saying. And it was, it was like being back in my childhood horror of being accused of something I hadn't done, of not having the words to explain what I had didn't do. I mean, you can't prove a negative. Fortunately, the pension woman had a grandson who spoke very good English, and he translated for me what the police were accusing me of. And I told him, I, I don't know what they're talking about. And I repeated the woman's story. And he finally convinced the police that the story was true, that I, that I, I wasn't a danger to the Spanish fascist regime. And the police left and the young man said, if I were you, I would leave as soon as possible. And so um, I had to stay one more night and the next morning I got up and left with my suitcase and went to the botanical garden and met a Mormon missionary who was looking for someone who would share the gas. And so the two of us took off and we had more incredible experiences with the Guardia Civil. And one of the things that in a fascist state, there's no privacy, there's no hiding. Everybody knows everybody, everything. And the state makes it there. And of course that was before cell phones and all that stuff. But I'll tell you just one more incident which was, um, we picked up, we used to pick up hitchhikers. That was a way to practice Spanish. He spoke better Spanish than I did, but we, and we picked up this young man who was a little agitated and it turned out he lived very close to where we were going. So we offered to take him home. And as we approached his home, this woman came running out, yelling, very upset and Guardia Civil. And I recognized the word ayuda, meaning help. And I said, okay. And the man I was, I'll call him Randy. He said, I'm not staying. I'll, I'll, I'll drive the car and I'll wait for you. And he took off. And the woman grabbed me inside and she, she had her son lift all these mattresses and put her son under the mattresses. She took off my clothes and gave me a kind of a burlap dress and she smeared manure all over it and stuffed pillows in. And she just put me on top of these mattresses and said, mm, mm, when the Guardia burst in and they're looking for, it turned out to be her son and they're overturning everything and they're knocking her to the ground. And meanwhile, I went, oh, 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 as, because I was terrified. And they came to me and of course I smelled like pig shit, which is what it was. And they would, you know, they knocked her around even more because she was living in a sty. And then they left in disgust. And she went like this. And I didn't move. I don't know if I could have. And finally, she decided it was okay. She pulled me off. She lifted the mattresses. She had some food prepared for her son. And he took off. And she helped me wash as best I could. And then she decided to give me a present. I said, I, I don't need a present. Uh, well, the present was a raw egg and she broke the egg and she put it in a bowl and I was obviously meant to eat it. Well, 
That was even harder than dealing with a Gordia Seville, but I actually ate it. And then she, she helped wash me and I got dressed in my clothes and, and I didn't even know where this man was. And he had my suitcase and my passport and my money and everything else. And I just started walking down the road and I walked for quite a long time until finally I heard a little beep and he had hidden the car in the bushes and he could smell me, he said, you stink. And so even though it was our, we would spend one night in the car and one night in a hotel, we went to the hotel that night so I could take a shower. And um, it, and that when we got to Madrid, I was offered a job teaching and I realized if I could get in, and there were le many other incidents, if I could get into this much trouble, not intending to get into any trouble, goodness knows what I would what would happen if I actually lived there. So I turned that job down. But it was a the reason I'm sharing this experience is that it was like the outside was a representation of the inside that I had always lived with, and I had the same feeling of how, how is this happening to me? I am I'm not. I'm not doing anything. I mean, in the restaurant, I just wanted to eat my food. And in the second incident, we're just helping a hitchhiker. I mean, it wasn't like I was trying to do anything. I wasn't that brave. And I didn't, I mean, I just, it was just such a, a outside inside experience that it realized that my home was like a fascist state, even though ironically, my parents were, interested in the arts and and they were interested in social justice and just didn't uh come to me so that was uh, an experience of outside inside um is there anybody who wants to ask any questions about that feel free to unmute yourself if you have any questions well you might ask what comforted me as a child. And as a very young child, I developed this capacity to tell myself stories and I could see them and hear them and feel them and smell them. And I also took comfort from old stories. And people have asked me how, I sometimes say stories saved my life or stories kept me going in a difficult time. And I'd like to give you an example of a story that played a really important part in my ability to deal with the leukemia I was dealt with, which was very rare. And it was just, people didn't really know much about it and everything the doctors said at the time turned out to be wrong. And I would go to the waiting room and I would wait for the, the tests. I would wait for the results. I would wait for the exams. I would wait for the um, medicine. And um, there's a story. And in this story, the characters ask, is this all the world there is? And then there's another question where a strange creature comes and they ask, is this all the world there is? And, and these, these questions resonated. And so I would sit in the waiting room and I would tell myself this story. So I hope it's okay with you if I tell you this story. It's, it starts like this. The people were in the darkness, bumping around and asking each other after a while, is this all the world there is? It, will we never find another world? And of course it was all the world they had ever known. And so nobody had an answer. And then one day a strange creature appeared and they said to the creature, is this all the world there is? And the creature whose name was Mole said, well, I don't know, but sometimes I go to a place that feels different. And they question him, what do you mean it feels different? How does it feel different? And Mo said, well, I can't really tell you because I'm blind and I just can tell you it feels different. And so one brave soul said, well, would you take us to this place that feels different? And Mo said, well, I'm happy to take you, but I take the earth, I burrow the earth, and I take it and I put it behind me. And if you come with me, you will never be able to go back to where you came from. And I could never go back to where I had been before the illness was diagnosed. And so 
I was traveling blind. And I felt like those creatures, those, those people in the following mole, not knowing where this place was that felt different, not knowing what it meant to feel different. And then at one point, mole says, well, this is as far as I go. Lots of luck, bye. And he left. And the people didn't know what to do. They didn't know where they were. And so one of the people went and walked out and screamed in pain, came running back and said, this is a terrible place. The pain in my eyes is just awful. What shall we do? We can't go back. And then they heard a voice of grandmother spider and she said, my children, the reason your eyes hurt is because you're not used to the sun. You're not used to a new way of living, I told myself. And she gave them instructions. They were to go outside with their hands in front, keeping their eyes closed and then slowly opening their fingers and slowly opening their eyes. And then it was night and they went back and she said, I will see you in the morning. Of course, they didn't know what morning was and they didn't know how long morning would be. And in the morning she came and she said, my children, if you follow what I tell you to do, you will be well. Do not go north to the cold mountain, you will freeze to death. Do not go west to the black mountain because you will die in the darkness. Do not go east to the mountain of the red mountain, creatures will kill you and you will drown in your own blood. If you want to live, you must go south and you must walk and walk and walk. And I will tell you how you know when you have come to the land that is home. You will see a creature that reminds you of me on its back will be a web-like design. And when you approach it, it will pull in its head and it will not be able to see. And it will remind you of mole. So some people went to the, they said, we're not gonna wait. We're not gonna go that long way. We'll go to the mountain in the North. And they never came back. And some people said, well, we, we're used to darkness. We'll go to the West, but they never came back. And finally, some said, we're strong, we're warriors, we can deal with the blood, but they never came back. And now there were only two people left, a man and a woman, and they didn't know what to do, but they couldn't stay where they were. And I couldn't stay where I was. And so they started walking and they didn't really know where they were going. They just kept going and going and walking and getting tired and feeling like giving up, but they kept walking. And then finally, one day, the woman saw a strange creature and the man said, watch out, it might eat you. And the woman went over and she said, look, it reminds me of grandmother spider. And the man came over and he saw it pull its head in. Of course, it was a turtle, but they didn't know that. And he said, it reminds me of mole. And they had come to the land that was home. And ironically, Some years later, I'm trying to think of, I started telling my story, the self that's her in 85. And in 2000, without looking, I bought a home in Santa Fe. And that's exactly the area where the story comes from. The white mountain is Taos. The black mountain is the Hemis. The red mountains is the Sangres. And the place that is home is the Sangrias, Sandias. So without knowing it, I had actually told myself the story that would prove to be the land that became my home. And I've lived here for 20 years. So I think that story it, it responded to all of the questions and the uncertainties. And it, it was very comforting. And I would just tell it to myself and imagine myself in that situation. And that's how I managed the waiting room. I have a question. Yes. Um, well, as I read your book, I was struck by two things, a lot, many things, but I love the story of Paul Robeson and his strength and, and ability to put your mother in, in her place. So that was the first I'd love for you to talk a, a bit about that. And then also the creativity that you used to enrich children's lives that you worked with you as an educator, even and not just children, but also in your college experiences. So if you could uh, address those two things, I would, I would appreciate it. 
Well, the incident with Paul Robeson is, um, he was giving a house concert and my parents were invited and my sister was a little baby. And so I was supposed to babysit my, my sister and I was in the bedroom with my sister and I heard this voice. Uh, well, the baby started crying and I heard a voice say, don't worry, ma'am, I'll just, I'll just sit with the baby for a few minutes. And um, I heard this very deep voice singing to this baby and the baby stopped crying. And I wanted to be near that voice. And I got out of, I pushed my blankets around my sister and I, and I went and I felt really, I didn't know the word, but I felt really jealous. I wanted to be that baby. I wanted that man to sing to me. And I don't know if you've seen pictures of Paul Robeson, but he's a very, he was a very, he was like six foot four, a football player. And he had a very big chest and he must have felt that I was watching and he invited me in and I sat on his lap and he had the baby in one hand and me around. And then my mother came up the stairs to check on my sister, saw me in Paul Robeson's arms and started yelling about how my sister was going to fall out of bed and so forth. And he interrupted her and he said, ma'am, your daughter's just fine. And the baby's just fine. Why don't you just go downstairs and I'll finish up here and then I'll come downstairs. Just go on downstairs. And much to my shock and amazement, my mother went down those stairs. She didn't hit me. She didn't come after me. Well, I think she was secretly in love with Paul Robeson, as I was. <laughs> but it was the only time I can remember in my childhood where I felt safe. And that had a big impact about how it, how, what it takes for a child to feel safe. I mean, you don't have to be in the arms of a six foot four handsome black man. There are other ways. And one of the ways I discovered early on from my time working with the children in the hospital is that paying attention to the children, listening to them and not imposing my will on them, but offering suggestions. I also started working with paints and finger paints and clay as part of the stories and having them respond. And I discovered that the children were hungry for an adult to respect them, to pay attention, to, um, to honor their differences. And I didn't know the word ambiguity at the time. And I was a kind of right, left, up, down, black, white person. Things were right or wrong. I mean, I was like that. But somehow when I worked with the children, there was, I could feel myself softening and that rigid code where I, it's how I survived, but I wasn't very flexible emotionally to say the least. But when I was with the children, especially the young children, I, I did a lot of work with two, three and four year olds and kindergartners and first graders. And I could go into a room where there was just complete chaos. I mean, children practically hanging from the ceilings. And I would sit down on the floor and I would just say, and I would just keep mouthing those words, not saying word. And finally, one, one kid would come up and bear say, Miss, could you just speak a little louder? And so then I would start to whisper. And pretty soon, I would have all the kids in a bunch or in a group in a circle. And then I would ask them, so does it feel better to be where we are now? Or did it feel better before I came in? And they would say, no, it feels better now. And I would say, why? And they say, because it feels safe. And so that seemed to be the most important thing that I took from my childhood into my teaching. And even with university students, to, in order for people to feel safe, they have to feel that who they are is okay. And I could do that for other people, but for the longest time, I couldn't do it for myself. And I feel very fortunate because I now have a good life, in, but I still have lots of darkness and it'll come upon me with no warning. And I recognize that this is still part of that old 
damage, only it doesn't hook me the way it used to hook me. And for that, I'm really grateful. I've got to go, thank you. Does, does anybody have any more questions? I have maybe one more um, before uh, we wrap up here. Um, how did you manage during the pandemic, Nancy? I told myself a lot of stories and I did a lot of hiking by myself. And um, I developed something that I had never really done before. I call it my telenovela, but it was a long running story with characters that kept changing. It was a little bit like a soap opera except that it was alive in my head. And between stories and hiking and talking with friends on the phone, um, I managed, but stories have been my lifeblood and helping people tell their stories has, has really made me feel that my life was meaningful. And I hope that when people read my memoir, they will be, encouraged to tell their own stories and to look at the stories told about them because a lot of the stories told about us by our parents are told by our parents for their benefit, not for ours. And that the stories that are our stories have to be recovered and maybe discovered anew. So before we um, finish, I'd like to say that if anybody would like to buy a copy of my book, it's available on bookshop.org or Amazon. But if you'd like an autographed copy, you can go to my website, nancykingstories.com, or you can email me, nanking1224 at earthlink.net, and I can figure out how to work with you. Um, and I'd like... I'd like to share the, this blessing. Um, it's from an old Gaelic chant in which nine graces are invoked to bestow their, bestow their love upon a person. And then the following words are spoken. A shade thou art in the heat, a shelter thou art in the cold, eyes thou art to the blind, a staff thou art to the pilgrim, an island thou art at sea, a fortress thou art on land, a well thou art in the desert, health thou art to the ailing, let there be joy. A million times thank you, Nancy. Um, thank you all for coming. A pleasure. I love hearing your stories. Um, I very much appreciate reading your memoir. I encourage everyone to read Breaking the Silence. We have it on the shelf here at the library. Um, but contact Nancy and get yourself a signed copy as well. Um, everyone stay safe, read books, read Breaking the Silence and have a great rest of your evening. And be cool. Oh yeah, stay cool. Thank you everybody. I really appreciate your coming. Good night. Good night.